the main event and without further ado i would pass this to brother ayman from icv inshallah hi uh, jazakallah khair brother tegu uh, can you hear me okay i'm not i'm not used to having a microphone i feel feel like a bit of a rock star es especially with the, the the camera as well so please um let me know if you can't hear me clearly and i'll, I'll adjust the microphone very clear good humble great to hear okay uh just a quick couple of housekeeping before i begin um there's a registration sheet that's circulating around i hope um hang on Maybe it's this one here. If you can just put your name and your email address uh, to that sheet. Um, the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because all of the slides that I'll go through today and all the information, I will be, inshallah, sending it across to the email address which you provide. And it's also an opportunity um, for us to keep you updated on changes in um, the legislation, changes in the standards as well. So. Um, we ask that if you can, please fill out the um, information sheet and all the information will be kept um, private and confidential, of course. Um, do, has, has anyone heard of the Child um, Safe Standards and Reportable Conduct? Is that, uh, just, just to get a bit of a, a background, is that, uh, is that familiar to everyone? Has, have, you, have you heard of it? No, we've got nods of no. Uh, uh, sisters, anyone in the, the sisters, have you heard of it? Okay, well, you got one person that's heard of it, possibly. So, so it's it's fairly new to all of you then. So it's, it's something that's fairly new. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask is, um, how many of you would deal with uh, children, maybe through a madrasa, maybe through a sporting activity in the, in the masjid? One couple of people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perfect, because uh, that's 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 the 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 target audience really. It's for we're looking for organisations for people big and small that are working um, with with children. Okay, um, what I might do is, is our sessions a little bit interactive as well, because I don't want to. I don't like the sound of my own voice for one, and two, I, I don't want to bore you. And because we're going to cover a bit of governance and compliance, it's not the most interesting subject but it is one of the most important subjects so i'm going to try to ask you questions along the way um just to see how alert you are so i hope you've had a morning coffee or afternoon coffee or a tea or something as well so i'm going to start by asking why do you think we need child safe standards anyone want to want to answer anyone Sister? Exactly. Yes. To uh, that, That's exactly right. So the whole uh, modus, the whole modus operandi behind the child safe standards is to ensure the safety of, of children. Um, that's really the main thing. And the safety of ch children is responsibility. That's, that's really at the heart of all the, the child safe standards. Now, the stuff that we're going to cover today, look, um, some of it you will have um, heard about some of it you would have you would have known um, some of it will be new but don't be don't be daunted um, our role here today is to try to work with you in trying to um, I suppose bring your organization uh, bring uh, uh, up to uh, the level of the standards so don't, don't be daunted by any of the uh, the stuff that we cover uh, our whole role here is to support you through the whole process okay all right. Okay. I wanted to start with with a little uh, hadith uh, from the Prophet Whoever does not show mercy to our children, nor does he recognize the right of our elders, then he is not of us. Now, I think that's a really important uh, hadith because what we're trying to say here is that uh, the the notion of child safety is not. Um, is an inherently Islamic one. It sits within our own tradition. It's in our own deen. It's very important. So it's not a it's not a foreign concept. It's not an alien concept. It is something which is part part and pr practice of our deen. So when we are practicing it, we need to um, demonstrate that we are uh, putting uh, the the safety of children first. So start. Okay. Now. Uh, 
thought I'd give you a little bit of background and rationale around uh, the child safety standards, why, why they're here, how did they come about, and, oh, thanks, Paula, if you can, yeah, I'll be good. Sorry, okay, so, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but um, back in about 2012, the Victorian government had a uh, royal commission, uh, a, a state commission, um, into uh, child abuse. So you may or may not be aware, but there were a lot of um, uh, cases of child abuse occurring uh, within uh, the Catholic, ch uh, Catholic Church and the Christian churches, um, also within the Jewish schools and across other institutions. That basically um, prompted the government to um, run a royal commission. And you probably you, you were probably aware of the Royal Commission into Banks, which has revealed all sorts of things recently. That's the most recent Royal Commission. Well, prior to that, um, the state government had a commission into um, child abuse, um, really around what was happening and uh, more, more importantly, how do we how do we prevent it? Because that's what we're all about here today. How do we pre prevent child abuse occurring? So. Um, they had a commission and they they invited a lot of different uh, stakeholders, bodies. Um, the Islamic Council of Victoria was also invited to come and speak at that particular commission. And from that, they, they came out with a couple of recommendations. So these basically, these recommendations basically are the framework for the seven child safety standards, which we're going to be talking about today and the reportable conduct, conduct scheme. So essentially the... the, the the motives behind those standards are to drive cultural change so that protecting children is always at the forefront of your mind. So that that word cultural change is, is, is probably the most important thing and probably the most important thing that I suppose hope that you get out of today. Um, and, and it's also the, the, consequently the first standard as well. Um, changing the culture so that whenever, whichever um, Whatever practice that we're doing, the, the safety of the of the child is always at the forefront. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. One more. Sorry. Yep. Okay. So as I mentioned, here's a here's a bit of the background. So it was January 12. You had the inquiry. Then you had uh, this report. So if anyone wants to know a little bit more about that royal commission and the report and some of the outcomes, there is a report which is publicly available. It's called the Betrayal of Trust. And then you have the the Victorian government putting into a place the the legislation by which these child uh, safe standards are governed. Okay. Okay. So. Again, here, it's just a bit more of a timeline. In 2015, the legislation came into place, Child Wellbeing and Safety Amendment, or the Child Safety Standards Act. January 2016 was when they started to phase in these child safety standards into different organisations. So they started with schools, so government schools, private schools, um, things of those nature. And then in 2017 was the second phase. And the second phase is the phase which probably all of us here, because it was looking into... Um, religious organizations um, and bodies that deal with um, youth. Um, so uh, things like uh, madrasa classes, um, things like uh, sporting classes, all of those, all those organizations, no matter how large they were or how big they were, had to comply or have to comply by that law. Now you're probably looking at that timeline and thinking it's 2019 today and it's 2017 when this law actually came into place. And you're probably, maybe, maybe you're panicking or maybe you're worried that your, your organization isn't, isn't in compliance. That's okay. The commission um, is very understanding, understands that this is a really, really big task trying to um, one, I suppose, get the information out there about the law and the changes and to trying to actually um, commit to those changes within those organizations. So what, so part of our role here is as well is to try to start you on that journey of getting your um, organization up to compliance to those seven standards. So don't freak out by the, um, the commencement date. Um, it's, uh, as I say, it's a work in progress. So we want to work with you towards um, getting those standards in place. All right, so who is affected? Who is affected? So I've kind of touched on 
But um, pretty organization, anyone that is really um, working with children, really, in any capacity, um, big or small. Um, even organizations that are hosting events, um, you, you may be auspicing your building or you may have a community group, for instance, um, we've got this beautiful space here um, in Western Worcester, um, and the organizing committee might not be running an event for uh, that, uh, running a madrasa class, and might be outsourced to someone else. Still, the person that um, is still responsible will still be the committee that actually runs the masjid itself, even though you might not, you may not be running that class, or you may not be running that activity or event, still the responsibility will still fall um, uh, in the hands of um, the committee. That's, the, that's one of the biggest sort of changes in the, um, in, in the standards. So if you can just jump to the next slide. So... Here you go. So you should be aware of the new child safe standards. CEO, owner, director, principal. Um, obviously, this is going to change depending on the structure of your organization. Um, it might be the imam. It might be um, the, the teacher. It might be whoever the coordinator. But essentially, if you look at it there, um, it's pretty much the entire organization that needs to be across the standards. It's not just, I mean, it used to just be at one stage just the CEO. But now it's no longer just the, the head of the organization. It's the person below, the manager, the team leader, the volunteer, the contractor, the person that comes in, the agent, the employee. Everyone, everyone needs to be aware of child safe standards. And that is really, really important because one of those findings in that report was that, you know, um, when people were not aware of the standards or people were not aware, um, that led to um, cases of child abuse. Okay. Um, before I go any further, the types of child abuse, the, 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 the several types of child abuse. Does anyone want to have a guess of what they might be? Yep. Physical, yep. Physical, most common, yep. Physical abuse, absolutely. That's one form of child abuse. Yep. Anyone else? Grooming, yes. Well, grooming is a function of it, yes. Yep, grooming. Continue. Sorry, anyone else? Anyone else? Verbal abuse, yep, verbal abuse. Anyone else? Sexual abuse, of course. Sexual abuse, that's important. And negligent, yeah, perfect. So negligence, that's the other one, neglect. So does everyone know what the, 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 those type, roughly physical, uh, sexual, uh, neglect, verbal, do, do, do people know what those types of abuses are, roughly? Monsieur? I mean that you're gonna you're kind of across what what's what what that kind of abuse looks like yes hopefully okay um ne neglect is a really interesting one because it's not often spoke spoken about so neglect means um it's your obligation um to look after the i suppose the child's needs while they're in your care so if you're in a masjid here you have to make sure that if it's a hot day that the child um is is well hydrated has access to food also obviously if you know um, adequate shelter and things like that. So often people don't think about uh, neglect. Another thing that people don't often think about as well is um, is abuse which occurs online. It's not often thought about, but we do live in a digital age um, of social media. Young people are more savvy. Almost everyone maybe above the age of five or six nowadays has a phone in their hand. So they're also could be privy to online abuse. So that is something that you also really need to be um, conscious of as well. Okay. All right, what should I do? What should I do? What do you think you should do? Um, if, 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 um, if, if something like uh, an, an incident occurs in your, in your mosque, what do you think you should do? What are some of the things that you should do? Report it, yep. So. Uh, report it to the, yep, yep, great, okay, anything else? Right. Yeah, okay, hey. so who would you, who would you, so who would you report it to normally in, a, in your traditional sense, who would you report it to? Coordinator, yep, great, yep. Okay. 
Uh, any other suggestions? Child, protect, child protection services, yep, okay, that it depends on the extent of the abuse, yep, great. Anyone else? Sorry? Authorities, yeah, police as well, that's right. So those are the things that uh, to, to consider. Um, so you have the, obviously, um, part of what we're doing today is to try to, to work with you to, to, to develop a structure where you should be able to report it to your um, to a person that's responsible in your organization, which will usually be someone senior. But in serious cases, you should always report it to the police. Triple O, always your first point of call. Um, and then the other person, the other body that you should report it to as well is, um, and depends, depends on the type of abuse, is the Commission for Children and Young People, which is, the, which is a commission which has been set up to look after um, inquiries and handling around child abuse. And we're gonna talk about reportable conduct a little bit later on, but let's jump to the next slide. Okay, so, sorry, went to report child abuse. Here we go. Sorry, I missed a slide here. So these are some of the reasons when, when you should report child abuse, when, when a child discloses abuse, um, when a child says they know someone who has been abused, a friend, relative, acquaintance, or sibling of the child says that the child has been abused. It might be something that you've observed. You might be a teacher and that you've observed it and you think beyond reasonable doubt that there has, uh, abuse has occurred. There might be signs of physical or sexual abuse as well. That, that's, that's always a telltale. So you don't need to have proof to report any concerns you have about the safety of a child or young person. Okay, that's important too. Okay. By the way, um, please uh, stop me at any time if you want to if you want to clarify anything or you have any further questions, as well. Okay, so I wanted to jump into the seven child safe standards, um, and this is basically the framework around what your organisation basically needs to um, adhere to, come up to, to comply with the new um, legislative changes um, that government have mandated. That's, that's a lot of um, compliance talk. Um, it's it's not as daunting as it sounds, but we'll, we'll go through each of the each of the standards one more one. Yep. Okay, so doo -doo 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 -doo. those are the, those are the the standards in um, th these are the standards in summary, and we'll we'll go through each of them. The first standard is um, strategies to embed an organisational culture of child safety, including through effective leadership arrangements. So that was was what I was referring to, to change in your in the culture of the organization. So I think that one is probably the most, for me, I think is the most important because it's gonna be very difficult for you to change the culture in your organization to ensure that you put the needs of a child first. So cultural change is often the most difficult. The second uh, standard is having a child safety policy or statement of commitment to child safety. So that is basically, you know, having um, a statement saying that your organization is committed to the well-being of children. And these are the steps that we've put in place to try to ensure um, their safety. Now, a lot of people look at that and think of it as a negative thing, but I think you flip that around and it's actually a really positive thing. It's something that you can advertise if you're running like a madrasa or something like that. You can say, we are a child safety organization. You can trust us. We comply by these legislations and here, here is our statement of commitment. Now, uh, there's, there are templates for, for that, which, which I'll go into at the end of, um, end of this particular session. Um, and you're also welcome to go and have a look. Um, I'll have a resource page as well. So you can have a look at some of the examples of the different um, child safety policies or statements of commitment. Third standard is a code of conduct, which basically um, establishes clear expectations for appropriate behavior for children. So um, a code of conduct, almost like a code of ethics, really. It's really talking about um, what you can do in the organization and what you can't do in the organization. Okay. The fourth one, uh, Charles, uh, the standard number four is about screening, supervision, training, and other human resources practices that reduce the risk of child. So that's really about looking at um, some of your human resources and how do we look at um, working to ensure that um, they promote the risk, uh, they, they promote the risk of reduction of child abuse. So 
Um, working with children uh, is, is, is one thing to do, is, is, is something that I'm sure some of you would have heard of as well, is one element. But uh, how many people have heard of the working with children, by the way? You have? What do you think is the problem with just having a working with children check and nothing else around it? What do you think is the, the, the sort of downside of a working with children check? Do you wanna, does anyone want to have a guess? It's not too hard to get one. Okay, yeah, it is. It's not too hard to get one. That's one thing. Anyone else? All right. Okay, so the, the problem with just having a working with children's check is it's just a snapshot of time, basically. So if you applied for a working with children's check, it's valid for about five years. It doesn't really tell you anything about the person, actually. It'll tell you maybe in that particular time that, you know, they're cleared, but it doesn't really tell you anything else. So a lot of people use a working with children's check as a little bit of a cross saying that uh, we're, we're covered. We've got this check in place. We've ticked. We've ticked a box, and that's it. Well, we're good. But that actually does not prevent child abuse. There are lots of instances of of people having working with children's checks and still committing act. Do not rely solely on the working with children's check. That's what this particular standard is talking about. It's talking about um, ensuring that you know when you advertise a, a position that. Um, you know, uh, that you, you you let people know that you are a child safe organization and that they will sign that statement or that, that code of conduct, um, that you do adequate reference checks as well. So you want to do two two to three reference checks. I know that it's it's a time intensive thing, but it's it's really important that you that you do the, the correct background to try to reduce incidences of child abuse. That's really important. Um, the fifth one is really important, obviously, it's a process for responding to reporting suspected child abuse. So when an incident might occur in your organization, how do I respond? Who do I go to? What do I do? What are the steps I need to take? Uh, stra stra number six is um, strategies to identify and reduce or remo remove risks of child abuse. That's really about risk management, you know, and, you know, it might be things like if we're thinking about a masjid and you're thinking about, um, you know, holding classes, um, if a child needs to go to the, the, the toilet, where, where are the toilets located? Are they going by themselves? Are they, or are they going with someone that's supervising them? You know, because that time that they might be away from adult supervision is a potential opportunity as well. It's a risk. It's a risk. It's something that you have to consider. You know, are you doing your classes in a closed room? Does, does it have glass windows where, you know, things are visible? If it's not, that's, again, uh, another risk. So these are some of the things that you kind of need to think about. So really, uh, standard six is really about risk management. How do we reduce the incidence of, again, how do we reduce those risks? Um, strategy seven, uh, or child safe standards number seven, is really important. It's about um, promoting the participation and empowerment of uh, children. And that's really about having children involved in the project. Children need to be able to feel empowered and confident enough to speak up, to be able to, one, trust the people that are um, guiding them, teaching them, and two, feel empowered enough to actually report the abuse. That's really, really important to have the child's, uh, you know, buy and have them empowered part of that particular process as well. Okay? All right. Uh, so that, again, here we go. We're just, just going into each, of, each one of those standards in a little bit more detail. So culture of child safety. Um, so one of the ways to do that is to obviously try to run training and try to make as many people in your organization aware of the new child safe standards and the importance of, of, of uh, child safety. So, and, and to do that, you, you know, you do it at your regular meetings, your, your staff meetings, you address them and you, you let them know that this, this is what's coming into place and we're going to do some training around that. Um, the other thing is being aware of allegations, substantiated cases of abuse, and finally, it's about committing to continuous improvement. So it's not a static thing. It's not, again, the whole idea behind this isn't a tick-the-box exercise. You don't attend the session and you're suddenly a child-safe organization. It is a continuous thing. It's a dynamic thing. It's something that you have to continuously work towards. That's what the cultural change is. So something you always want to review. So that is, that's really, really important. And Again, um, I can't say this enough. Everyone in the organization should know. Everyone that works in the organization needs to know about the, the, the child safety. Okay. Okay. 
Again, examples uh, as I kind of went through, providing induction training um, in recognizing and responding to child abuse, um, uh, potentially pu uh, putting someone in charge. So you could you could uh, say, you know, this person's gonna be our, our child safety um, officer champion and they're responsible in terms of a lot of the um, uh, training and changes. Um, Obviously, promoting confidential reporting uh, culture, that's really important, and maintaining adequate records, yeah? That, 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 that goes without saying. It's really important to maintain adequate records, and you'll see why that's important when we talk about um, uh, the reportable conduct scheme as well. Um, reviewing policies and procedures. Again, policies and procedures are not uh, do them once, they're done. They, they don't collect dust. They are a dynamic document. You need to be referring to them all the time. They need to be at the forefront of your organization. So when you're, when you're welcoming new people, when you're introducing them, they should be up as well on your organization's boards as well. That's really important as well. So don't look at them as just signing off and that's kind of it. And obviously making sure that those policies are communicated clearly to everyone in your organization. That is really essential. So everyone needs to um, understand what what it, what you're committing to okay okay so number two is is the statement of um statement of commitment so basically again it's an affirmation of the organization's commitment um to child safety um and it's really just a, a public statement which um is no more than a page and it's again helping to raise awareness and to stay to state one, we are a child safe organization. Um, it's great for the organization. I think it's great for the morale of staff to say that we are, we're, we're an organization you want to work with because we promote child safety. And on the flip side, hopefully it acts as a, a deterrent and a warning to others that might want to come in. They know that this organization has really st strong standards and that, you know, things like abuse won't be able to occur. Um, again, I'll, I'll show you, we'll go, we'll have a look at some examples uh, in the resources section. Yeah. Yep. It would, it would be, oh, you probably don't need to put it in your, your constitution, I mean it would be great, uh, probably doesn't fit in the constitution so much, but probably in your, um, uh, in your HR, if you have an operations manual or something like that, the, where we have put it is uh, basically on our website. And we put it out the front of the, the in the, the city mosque as well, so it's visible for the people that walk in, um, and then it's visible for people that are uh, you know visiting the website. And they might be visiting your social media, so where you where you basically get most of the um, the visibility. Yes, absolutely, I agree. I, I think it's important to you know put it out the front of of the mosque, and that what we what we try and encourage as well. Just to you know, to, to to let people know that this is a um, you know child safe mosque. Yep, absolutely. It's a it's a good idea. Yep. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, and guys, again, um, when we do go, when we have a look at the resources and things like that, don't don't uh, be alarmed or don't worry about oh I'm going to have to draft a whole new statement or or anything like that. Um, there are statements that have already been done already. There are templates which are already readily available. So all you need to do is you just need to adapt to your organizational setting, okay? So don't um, don't worry too much about, I suppose, the technical reason, but what is most important is um, just ensuring that, you know, everyone is aware of it and they understand it. That's the most important thing, okay? Yes, so we, we do have templates ready and available. So um, I'm gonna, again, and that's why the registration sheet is going around. The resources will have a link directly to them. I'll show you the resources as well. It's all av av available on the internet as well. So you, you, have a, um, you can visit it in your own time and, and peruse it in your own time. You can also, if you really want to as well, ICV, you can also visit our website to have an example as well. Um, but there are many, many different templates, and I'll provide you a link to all those resources as well. So you have that. So you guys aren't working from scratch. You're not working to create your own. What I'm suggesting is you look at the template which is provided. You adapt it to your organizational settings. But please don't look at it as a, a document that, you know, I've just done the template and that's it. My responsibility has finished. That's not what 
today is about, and that's not what the child safety stand is about. It's really everyone's responsibility to promote um, a culture of uh, child safety. So please, it, it, the, the more important thing is to make sure that everyone understands and it's, it's visible to all. But yes, the templates will be available. Okay. Okay, so do, 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 do. again, this is sort of going through um, that statement of commitment, you know, things that might be included. What is child abuse? Statement of zero tolerance on child abuse. Some of the risk management and prevention things that you might be doing. Um, potentially description of roles and, roles and responsibilities of personal involved in protecting children. And then obviously organizations commitments. So all of that you'll find in the, in, the, in, the, in the template as well, but these might give you some ideas on how to expand yours. Okay. Uh, you can skip the next slide as well. Yeah, it's just going over the same stuff. Okay, the third uh, standard is, is, the, is the code of conduct. Um, I'm sure some of you, are, are most of you aware of, of code of conducts and, and what they might be? And again, uh, there's a template available um, for the code of conducts. It, it, again, it's basic, your, your ethical, your guiding um, uh, outline and principles and how you should behave in your environment. And, you, and most people should have a code of conduct anyway. Um, it's really just about adapting, um, ad adapting it to suit um, uh, the child safety standards. Yeah. But really, it's just about um, establishing those clear expectations and boundaries for interacting with children. So, you know, a good way to, to I, I like to think about it is, you know, I will commit to doing this, and then you have a list of responsibilities, and we will not do this. That's a good way of looking at a fra for framing a, a code of conduct. Okay. Yeah. To, as in for, for, for parents? Well, no, this is actually targeting, um, well, it's more targeting organizations and, and that, are, that are running, um, yeah, so not necessarily the parents. There is a different session that we run for parents, but I'll, I'll talk, to the, talk about that in the end as well. Yeah. No, I mean, and so part of your responsibility, I mean, would be for a parent dropping their kids off would be to give them um, the statement of your compliance and um, a code of conduct. So they know this organization, this is what the employees can do and what they can't do. And this is what the organization stands for. So as part of good practice, I would be sitting down the parents that attend, give them those documents or point them to where they might be available. Um, if you want to take it a step further, you can also, in part, as part of that induction session, talk about the child safe standards and how you're embedding them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, sure. Well, I mean, look. I mean, code of code of conduct is is a, is also a good way of you know it's a, it's a good reference for you know hiring volunteers and employees and and parents that might want to drop their children. You might say that you know um, uh, you might get the parents if they want to attend the center that they need to abide by those code of conduct which has your rules of the center, which might mean not you know, running around, causing a, a mark, you know, all those kind of things. That, that's probably what you want to do. So you can, you can even adapt the code of conduct to that as well. So your center rules and then obviously around the, the and then obviously add components about um, child safety. We know, of, um, we know that other mosques around the state have also done that. So they, they say that if you do not comply or you do not sign this, and you, obviously understanding what is, what is written, then you will not be allowed to undertake your activities here in this particular masjid or in this particular center, and you will not be allowed, you know, um, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the organization has that, you have that um, um, uh, power, I suppose, as, as, as the organization running the, those classes. Okay. 
Again, um, you know, uh, going back through code of conduct, um, clear explanation of appropriate relationships with children for staff, volunteers, um, instructions on how adults should respond to any risks adults may pose to children or that children may pose to each other. That may be where, you know, a little bit of what you're talking about there. Um, clear and specific standards of conduct for working with children in different situations. Um, so again, the example there is physical contact. So if anyone is running, you know, soccer programs or anything like that, that would that's something that needs to you need to look at as well. Okay. Any from yeah. Sorry. Please stop me at any time and just put your hand up and interject if there's anything that you want to know. No. Okay. 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 Number four, we've um, talked about. It's really about human resources. How do you? How do you improve your human? How do you improve support your human resources to ensure that, you know, you're reducing the risk of child abuse by new and existing personnel? So, again, newly recruiting existing staff, volunteers, they have to understand the importance of child safety. So again, we're talking about running them through these um, policies, these these commitments, these code of conducts that they're trained, that they understand. Uh, what the um, what the organisation stands for? Again, a tool is working with children, of course. So, if they are directly working with children, they should have a working with children check. That is still important. But again, please do not rely on that solely as the um, uh, I suppose uh, the panacea to the solution. Um, ongoing support, supervision, training, critical, all critical to maintaining and reducing things. So again, not a static thing. You don't bring them into the organization and then just let them go. You need to continue supervising them. You need to continue training them. You need to continue to provide them support along that journey. Okay, do you go to the next slide? So I mean, it's so by 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 doing the, the 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 statement of commitment and the code of conduct and all of those things, that's already an element of training which you can walk them through already. So that 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 that, that you're already complying by by doing all of that. Yeah, refreshment of that risk management, all of that. You know, risk management is something that you you'd refresh regularly. Your policies are something that you'd pro you you should try and refresh annually as well. So you might have that statement of commitment up tomorrow, but you want to review it every maybe half a year to a year to make sure that it's current because you know that your circumstances might change. It might be the people that are coming into your center, or it might be the center's grown. It might be that the activities have changed in that center. So just as just as your organization doesn't say the same, uh, same with the call. It just needs to reflect the changes that is that's undergoing, um, that's happening in your organization, and also any other changes that might come through the, um, I suppose, the Child uh, Safety Act, which is what we we we'd communicate to you and let you know as well. Okay. Okay. So again, here we go. Designing and adhering recruitment and selection pro processes that focus on you know, things like, um, so here you go, uh, red flag. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're interviewing someone and there's a reluctance from that particular person to um, undergo working with children's check, that, that's just basically a red flag saying, well, perhaps this, or, perhaps this person isn't suited for this organization. That should be, if you're a child safety organization, that's immediately pops up as a, as a, as a warning, yeah? Um, so again, working with children's checks, police checks, Face-to-face -face interviews. Face-to-face -face interviews are really important to get a sense of the person, um, if you can. Um, assess people's motives when working with children. Why do they want the job? What, what, what interests them? And then referee checks are also another really good way to do um, uh, another way of complying as well. So make sure you do multiple reference checks, not just one, two, three, ideally, to try to ensure them. And then also, as I said, when you're, when you're advertising for a particular role, say that you're a child safety organization, say you've got a policy, say you have a statement, that's a really strong, you know, it's, it's good for your organization and hopefully it also deters anyone 
that doesn't want to comply away from it as well. So I suppose if you're if you're ticking off all of these things, you're you're pretty much ticking off most of the HR stuff. If that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Well, so we'll, we'll go at the end, we'll go, there's, a, there's actually a tool, an audit tool, um, but really the responsibility, I think, um, will be the head of that organization to make sure that it's head or someone that you nominate to, to, to be responsible for the child safe standards. So you can nominate, so you can nominate someone within your management committee, or it can sometimes fall to the head to ensure that that uh, audit process is, is followed through. No, 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 no. There's no, there's no certification body as such like that. It's, um, it's really, yeah, the, the, the onus is back onto the, the, the organization itself. Yeah. In terms of whether you're actually complying with the overall legislation, well, the commission has the power to actually come in and visit um, organizations to check to see if you are complying with the new laws. And if you are not, it is a severe fine. <laughs> But with that said, um, uh, they, are, they, aren't, they, they don't take the carrot and stick approach too much. So don't expect them to come and knock on your door straight away <laughs> or, or anything like that. But do know that they do have that legislative power to come in and, and, and actually you know, um, say that you know, you're not actually complying with those standards. <clears throat> Well, you're doing an organisational audit for your own organisation to to make sure that the organisation is up to up to the up to standard. Yeah. So no, that's not really the way the the commission works. So the commission is there again to try to support organisations. They understand that it's a pretty difficult process. Um, getting these things down because most organizations are voluntary, you know, they don't have, you know, human resource people, they don't have paid staff. So how can they expect you to just, you know, put all of these things together? I mean, that, that's why they're trying to support through templates, through um, training, through other resources and, and things like that. So they're actually not going to come and come into your organization, do an audit or anything like that necessarily. They have that, 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 um, capacity but what they want what they want to see is organizations moving towards actually implementing these standards does that make sense um and just like the head of organization is responsible for putting in the hr processes the normal hr processes in any in any organization that that's just it's just a follow-on from that so you're following on and you're just implementing these 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 child safe standards as a part of that particular process so that's not done by an the hr process isn't necessarily always done by an external body often in volunteer organizations or not-for-profit organizations done by you know, the internal management or someone that might be designated to do that kind of task. So usually that's where it would sit. Okay. 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 So do, 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 do. again, um, regularly provide information, training, education for employees about child abuse and child safety, including what child abuse is, how to identify and reduce child abuse risks. Um, what constitutes inappropriate behavior between children, between children and adults, such as grooming, all of those things. Um, and you're not going to be alone in that. We, what, again, what we, we'll try to do is we'll try to give you a lot of that information as well, and we will update you as well. That's why, again, why we want your the, the email addresses, because we try to update you around changes of information, or we might even send you a reminder saying, hey, we're approaching you know, um, the financial year. Have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? And crucially, you're not alone in doing this, so don't feel like you are going to be left alone. Um, we're here to support you as ICV, um, and the commission is there to support you as well. So you are not alone in this process. So if you, are, if you feel confused or you're unsure or if you're unaware, you can always pick up the phone, always contact us. You can always contact the commission, and they will walk you through it all. Okay. Okay, so again, we're just talking about human resources. You can probably skip to the next one. 
Um, okay, so reporting and responding. How do you report when uh, an abuse might have occurred? So, um, so organizations ha must have processes for responding to and reporting suspected child abuse. Now, um, I've got a flow chart which is coming up, which will, which will walk you through that particular process. But in brief, um, organizations need to ensure there's a supportive environment for children and families who report allegations of abuse, of child safety concerns. So they sh sh the person should feel comfortable enough in your organization to be able to report that abuse. They shouldn't be afraid or they shouldn't feel that there's any sort of distrust between um, the person um, responsible for that particular program. Implement clear policies and procedures to ensure staff, volunteers, families know how to report abuse allegations and feel comfortable doing so. Again, um, this is all sits within the line of HR, but when we look at the flow chart, maybe that's an example of something that you might want to stick up or something that you hand out during your induction. It might be something you hand out to the parents as well. As well. That's, that's another way of go, going about it as well. Clear policies and procedures for notifying authorities. So obviously we've talked about, you know, include talking notifying the police, child protection someone mentioned over there, and compl complying with all legal requirements, okay? So that's important as well. And then obviously we have, need to be clear on the responsibility of the personnel to report and to whom they should report. So we're talking about the reporting line. So understanding who to report to. So there's a clear distinction of where to report. Okay, uh, jump again. Um, do, 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 uh, appropriate, clear, robust. Um, again, this is reporting and responding. Do, do, do. So um, again, complying with all legal requirements, reporting child abuse to appropriate authorities. Um, Again, we're talking about step-by-step -step guides on how to report. So again, we'll have a flow chart, but you might want to take that into further detail. So if this happens, this is who you call. And if this happens, this is who you contact. And then it goes from there. Training staff and volunteers on how to report and identify signs of risk. That's important too. Um, and I think, again, publishing, uh, publicizing and making accessible avenues for reporting concerns for children. Um, so they need to understand, one, they need to understand where to go to report, and then they need to understand how to report. So those, that's really important as well. Because you're, again, we're, de we're dealing with really diverse communities, um, Muslim community, 45 different ethnic groups, have to be kind of considerate of those that are, that are you know, that are coming into your, your, your centers, so that they understand what is going on. So these are where diagrams and, and things like that are really, really helpful, okay? Uh, we can jump ahead. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Again, um, again, this is sort of going through a little bit of the detail. Contacting parents, how to provide support and comfort, providing ongoing support, things like that. You want to jump ahead? Okay, and I think I've lost my flow chart, but we'll circle back to it. It's somewhere in there. Um, standard six is risk management. So it's Organizations need to adopt a risk management approach um, by considering child safety risks. So remember I was talking about, you know, um, you know, uh, risk can be, you know, obstacles um, that might be present in the, in the area that you're working in. It can be um, around, as I mentioned, if that child is alone with someone in particular, what, what, what kind of process do you have in place? What kind of policy do you have in place? Um, concealed rooms. Um, that's 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 another thing to, con to, to consider as well. Um, so all those kind of things you need to think about um, around risks, okay? Now, um, there's also a risk management temp template which will be provided as, as a resource so you don't have to um, stress about, um, you know, how do I go about identifying relevant risks? It's there for you, but you just need to think about it in the context of your organization, yeah? Okay. Don't jump ahead. Oh. Um, okay, so again, we're just uh, continuing. So um, developing, recording, communicating clear processes for removing risks, provide staff and volunteers training in identifying risk. And obviously with risk registers, you need to update them quite regularly as well because again, 
your organization changes. It doesn't stay the same. Your building might change. You might implement new programs as well. So you need to be across that as well. So that's why it needs to be updated regularly. Okay. Yep. Uh, risk management policies, discussion. Um, so again, just more examples, discussions about apparent risks or near misses and team meetings, early identification, um, roster staff with experience to manage high risk environments. I don't think we we'll, I don't think many of us will be working in high risk environments, so that won't apply as much. Okay. Um, the final standard is um, organizations must have strategies to promote participation and empowerment of children. Organizations need to have um, environments where children feel safe and comfortable in reporting concerns of allegations or abuse. Um, often children do not report abuse because they feel uncomfortable or they don't know how to raise those concerns. So Center 7 is really about creating, again, what we're talking about, the final step is really about creating that environment which enables children to feel comfortable enough to, to report and knowing where to report to. So knowing the person to report to, that's really, really important. So the child has to be also part of, of, of that process, okay? Um, also, you know, trying to help children understand their rights, what to do if they report inappropriate behavioral concerns, that's also important as well, yeah? Uh, do, 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 do. Um, so the examples of how to implement um, assist children understand the right to make decisions about their their body and their privacy gather feedback from children about whether they would feel safe to raise concerns and on safe uh, child safe policies and processes okay this is always a it's always a little bit of a difficult one as well I mean how do you how do you include children in the process I mean how do you talk to them about um, child abuse and I think often this is this is a really 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 difficult conversation that 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 um, uh, organizations have um, but we again I've, for, for any organization that does feel uncomfortable with that standard or doesn't know how to implement it we again have access to a resource which will help you um, or, or train you to ask the those kinds of questions that they might feel comfortable around to help you shape that conversation. So again, you're not alone in this. It may, it may seem a little bit confronting and a little bit difficult, but we, we, will, we will try and support you around, around this as well. Okay. Ah, here we go. That's my flow chart. It's just jumped ahead a few places. This is going back to the reporting uh, process. What happens if um, an abuse, uh, an, an incident occurs in your organization? And so you can see right at the top who can report You've got the parent, you've got the child, you've got the staff member or volunteer. Those are the people that can report it. So going back to your point, it is really important that the parent is involved in understanding the, the child safe practices of your organization. What to report? Any child safety concerns, including disclosure of abuse or harm, allegations, suspicion or observation, breach of code of conduct, um, maybe environmental safety issues. And when I say environmental safety issues, I'm, again, I'm talking about obstacles, barriers, things that might harm a child, you know, that might be sticking out, um, those kind of things. That's really important. Call triple zero if the child is in immediate danger. It's always the first thing that you should do. Um, I always say that, um, even if you're running a mustard, if you're worried at all, call triple zero. Always the best contact. They will be able to guide you through um, almost, uh, most to everything. Okay, and then how? Options of reporting. So there's face-to-face -face verbal reports. There's a letter, an email, a telephone call, a meeting. Who does who, who do you report to? Who does that person send that letter to or that report or who do they call? It might be the represent, rep, rep, representative that you nominate in that organization. It might be the faith community leader that you, that you also nominate. Also might be, um, um, it might just be the head of that, that organization. But we leave that up to the, I mean, it's up to the organization to identify and, and work out what process works best for them. Um, you might have a subcommittee. It doesn't have to be one person. You might have a subcommittee on child safety and they're the persons, you know, they're, they're, you've got a, a primary contact and a secondary contact and they're the person that you go, you know, you report to. There's flexibility. There's flexibility as long as there's responsibility. Yeah. So as long as there's responsibility and people know that there is a clear reporting process, who to report to, okay? 
Then, after they after they've reported to that representative, they what what do they do next? What do they do next? They need to offer support to the child, the parents, the person who reports, and the Q staff member or volunteer. Then they initiate internal processes in their organization to ensure the safety of the child. So here, clarify the nature of the complaint, look at disciplinary process. This is again a lot of the, the HR work. And then decide in accordance with um, your duty of care whether the matter should be reported to the police, child protection, or um, potentially to the commission as well. Okay. Outcome, usually, if it goes down to that step, is investigation. Usually an investig investigation occurred, and we'll talk about that in reportable conduct. Um, an outcome has come through. Relevant staff, volunteers, parents are notified of that outcome of the investigation. And then policies and procedures may be updated if an incident occurs. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, but you have to write down the incident. You know, like you're, what, what, what that's talking about is, as in, you know, we're not, when we say proof, we're not asking for photographs or, or anything like that, or you're, you're coercing the child and grabbing the child and saying, you know, tell me in detail what you've did. Um, it's just about, it's just about a reasonable thing. What this is actually talking about is when that person reports the incident to you, that, that, that's the way they're communicating it to you. They might call you, so that might be a, a telephone call, or they might call you into a meeting. But what we always say is, um, if someone does make an allegation or something, try to put it in writing as well. So whoever's in charge or whoever's responsible, uh, that's this here, the Child Safe Standards Representative, put it in writing as well. That's really important. Because it's talking about recording, you know. You need to record and you need to, it's, it's about uh, um, uh, ensuring accurate record keeping as well, you know. Uh, part of that risk register stuff. That's why it's important that, you know, it's recorded as well. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So how should we prepare? How should we prepare? Well, luckily, we have a guide handily provided by the commission, um, which we will be providing to, I don't know how many I have, but Ideally, I'll try to provide one to each um, organization or each or try to uh, give one uh, to each representative per organization. And it basically goes into full detail a lot of the stuff that we've covered today. So, you know, it will talk to you about um, the Child Safe Standard 4, the privacy, the working with children check. It will give you a template as well, examples that you can use as a reference that you can look at. Here's your flowchart for the reporting process that we've just talked about just up there. There's a different flowchart there. Strategies to identify and reduce uh, uh, and reduce abuse. So, and then uh, here you go. You've got a, a, a child safe policy or statement. This is an audit tool as well. There you go. So you can match it up. So as I mentioned before at the start, you're not going to be left alone. The tools are here. The templates are here. The information is here. And the commission is always available. They have a phone number, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you in another uh, slide, which you can always contact if you're unsure as well, and they will help you clarify it. So again, not in the journey alone, and I'll try and see if I can send an electronic copy of this as well. I think I have one, but you'll, you'll have a physical copy and electronic copy as well. And if you want to jump ahead, next time I'll do this one, um, again, here you go. This this is that audit tool that I was talking about. This is this this is this particular resource has come from a website called childsafestandards.org.au, which is a um, which is a website created in partnership with the uh, the commission and um, various faith bodies um, to uh, assist different faith communities with implementing these different standards. So. This is a great little um, startup guide template, which um, which is provided online for you. And again, I'll, I'll I'll be sending you the link to this and the resources to this as well. But here you go. It's it's a good way to it's actually a really good way to start your process. So after the session, if you're really keen, or maybe on a Monday you might open this up and say, do I do I have childcare? Yes, no, action, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so here are the references and resources. So childsafestandards.org.au, Childwise, DHS, these are some of the references and resources that I've used. 
We've got the commission's website somewhere as well. Don't worry, I'll provide all of that. Again, I'll send these slides to you as well. You are not gonna be left in the cold. So if you don't have it, I will send it. And before I go into the reportable conduct scheme, I just wanna show you the Child Safe Standards website. Okay, so this is the website I was talking to you about, um, which was set up in partnership with um, uh, the, the commission and, and various faith bodies. So it's basically www.childsafestandards.org.au. It's a very, um, very simple website. It's got videos there as well. So videos to help you go through the process. Um, you'll see here the seven standards and, they've, and you can go through them and where to from here and then get started, my course, all those kind of things. I'll just click on all resources. Okay, and there you go. And if you click on all resources, here you go. Look at all these templates you have. So I did promise that you, you would be provided with templates and here you go. How to create a child safe culture, a statement of commitment, a self review tool, tool, HR policies and procedures. These are all freely available to your organizations to use. Please take the template and adapt them. But don't, as I said, leave them as a static document. They're dynamic, they're, they, they need to change, they need to be reviewed. That's part of the whole process, okay? But they're all done, everything is done for you. Everything is there, it's in place. You just need to go through that, change it to suit your organization, add your organization's logos, um, all of those kind of things. So it's all done, which is, which is, um, which is brilliant. Um, the hard process will be for you to implement all of them. In your organization that's the that's a hard process all of this stuff it's done it's done for you and it's all available okay where do i begin you've got videos there videos there as well definition of terms and videos there okay other website i wanted to show you was the ccyp commission for children and young people so they're the body which is being um which has the legislative responsibilities in carrying out um to ensure that organizations are complying with these child safe standards and the reportable conduct scheme. So their website also has a lot of resources as well that you can look into. So they've got a lot of fact sheets, they've got some templates, they've got some videos as well. Um, I will say that there is um, also, we're, we're very lucky enough to have a sister that is also a part of the commission in the audience today as well. So um, you can um, harass her later. She's, she's just sitting up there, so if you have any questions, she can she can help you out. But again, um, don't uh, the the commission is is there to support you as well, yeah. So they've got a, a a phone number as well. So if you have any questions around any of these things, then please um, you know you utilize these resources. Yeah, they're there for you. Okay. All right. Um, before I go into reportable conduct, does anyone have any questions at all or? because we've just covered the child safety standards a lot. I know it's a lot, it's quite dry. Again, I did say that at the start because it is a lot of compliance, it is a lot of governance, but it is really, really, really important. And um, I can't stress how important it is because you know often people think about um, uh, the community. I mean, you, you see all the cases um, that, that's happening in the Catholic church and uh, the Jewish schools and a lot of Muslims come up and say, oh, well, it will never happen in our community. It, it just never does. But I, I, I'm here to tell you that we, that the ICV itself knows of two cases within the Muslim community that have come to our attention of child abuse occurring within centers. So we are not immune from it. It is everyone's responsibility. And the impact um, that, an, that an act of child abuse can occur within a community is, is quite it's quite devastating. It's very, very, it's it's devastating and it's, it's heartbreaking as well, dealing with the consequences of it. So you want to be on the other side of it. You want to ensure that you have the, the best procedures in place to try to reduce that risk. So we as a community are not immune from it. It does happen. It happens in the community and it has a really devastating effect. Okay. All right. Yes. Piala. Yes, yes, all organizations. Yeah, so um, vo vo voluntary, not-for-profit, 
um, all, all those organizations. So that's why part of our um, uh, part of this process as well is for you to try to reach out to other people in your networks, in your communities that don't know about the changes in the legislation, just like you did know today about what was happening in the community. We want to reach out to people that are working with kids to let them know that this applies to everyone. Yeah, so non-formal organizations as well. Yeah. Yes. It'll also apply it'll also apply to that as well. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. So it doesn't matter how small it is, doesn't matter how large it is, um, or how informal the structure is, have it in place. Remember. It's better, as I said, it's better to have these in place. It, it's it's good practice, they say. It's, it's, good, it's good sunnah, really. So that's what it is. It's good practice to have it in place in whichever organization, whichever place you're in. So please, yeah. Okay. So any organization that you know that's dealing with uh, children, please let them know about these changes because it's really important that they comply. Legislation. Okay. Anyone else? Any more question? Sorry. Welcome, Salam. Sorry, I just can't. Yeah. It's a really great session. I thought it's really important to establish this oh. in our organization. Uh, do you have like, a suggestion to um, an organization that have like no HR and no, like division to yeah. specialize yeah. in this? Like how? Yeah. Is way too. Yeah. So look, I mean, the reality is, sister, that is most of the organisations that we talk to um, don't have a proper HR. They don't have, you know, um, a lot of those formalised, um, uh, I suppose, uh, departments. Um, and so, part of um, part of those templates that I showed you. So I don't know whether you noticed, but there was a HR policies and procedures there. So all of that is done for you. So what I would suggest is to look at those templates and try to modify from them. But alternatively, I'm, I'm happy to also um, sit down uh, sit down with your organization and try to give you, you know, some assistance around some of those HR, HR work as well. Well, mo most, most organizations try to leverage off their volunteers because mo most organizations are volunteer run, you know, so, but you know, with most volunteer organization, you also have, obviously you've got your head and you've got, you might have a management committee or, or someone that's responsible for that, that organization. So usually it would be within that and you try to work with um, the volunteers within your, your organization. So um, again, happy to sit down with anyone in your organization or, and what, what I like to say is don't leave it to one person to do it as well, because that's that's not much fun, and um, it's it can be pretty dry. So it, it sometimes is good to have two or three people establish a committee or something that you're all working on it together that you can bounce things off to 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 do those um those procedures. But again, we're we're happy to support you. The commission at the back is also very happy to to sit down and say, okay, how how do we how do we work with you to make it make it work? Thank yep. you so much. But yeah, we're we're, we're re really really co really conscious on the um on on the burden that's been put on <laughs> burden that's been put on the on the small organisations which don't have that resource, and so that's why we're trying to develop all these other tools and try to support you in that way to try to hopefully bridge that gap because it's you know we do un we we do understand that there's a, there's an issue there around you know not having um you know professional people that can actually follow through on these things. Oh, thanks so much for the answer. Maybe I just want to throw the question back to the community. Is there anyone interested in like to have a discussion after this about how I am CC and yeah, we are can continue to establish this moving forward? Uh, 
Mm. And look, uh, yeah, the, 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 yep. so we don't want to mm. make our organization part of the statistics. Yeah. So, would love to hear from you guys if anyone would like to put their hand up. So, the, yeah. I mean, like, again, I can't reflect on the biggest impact is actually. Um, is what it does to community when, when when a child abuse incident actually occurs. So, I mean, there's there's the, the non-compliance and the fines and things like that. But we all know that we're we're all we're all community. We're we're all part of communities, you know. And the impact of any any kind of abuse incident ha has really really far-ranging um, effects on the on on on, the, on that community. So, taking it out of an organisational point of view, it can have a lot of, you know, um, implications for, 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 for community. So that's why we really think it's important to try to, to reduce, um, yeah, that's, why, that's why we're here really, to ensure that things like this uh, that never happen again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, Salam. Um, so uh, I think what we, I think, yearn here is actually more a practical solution, okay. kind of like, do we have any, um, either not just workflow, yep. but kind of like maybe timeline, um, what to say, uh, um, it's good to have all this um, in place, but yep. then the very basic kind of like, what is abuse? How do okay. we deal yeah, with yeah. children? I yeah. think great. if we actually and, have that kind of program. Okay. And look, um, that's a really great uh, question, sister. And um, we've actually run a session, one one session actually in um, Hallam um, with a specialized trainer that was talking about what is abuse, how do you recognize abuse, the impacts of abuse. And again, um, if that is something that the, the, the community would like to um, explore and, and want to, to, to find more information on, I'm happy again to talk to the particular uh, uh, person. Unfortunately, I'm not specialized in that, so I didn't want to go into that area, but they do a incredible um, presentation around that. And I'd be happy to, I'm happy to talk to IMCV about trying to run something in the future. And it could even be part of your training as well, you know, as, as, as towards the child safety standards to give you a bit of context around it. But yeah, I agree. I think the context is really important, which really helps drive home the message. Well, think of it as the start of your journey. Look at it, look at it as a, as a, as a chance. Now you got, you're aware, you know what needs to be done. You begin the journey now. And as like I said, we're here to support you through that process. So if you want to have that session in the future, definitely we'll look at trying to bring someone out to talk to you about it if there is that, if there's that interest in there. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, brother, sorry. Welcome. Yeah. Um, is there any like a tool or um, you know like a tick box thing that you um, that you have to do to comply to the standard or uh, yeah, so uh, like to avoid the abuses, especially for the neglection thing? 
it's it's quite important. Is, is there a tick? Is there a tick box like tick tool box to? Tools, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so as in for attending this or just this are, you, more like, are, like events. Uh, oh, okay, like so you're talking, talking about uh, event specific. You're talking about your organisation and, yeah, and running yeah, events. events yeah, um, there is, and again, uh, it's something that that'll be part of your risk management. That'll be part of that risk management process. Is um, there, there is, there is. So. Um, going back into that um, section of resources and tools, there's a risk management section in there. Um, have a look at that. It will give you details around, um, you know, events and things like that, and then you can adapt it. So again, as you're working on these things, you know, feel free to send it back um, to us, through us, if we can, and we'll try to help you if we can add some kind of context around it. But you'll find something in the in the toolkit around that, brother. Yeah. Yeah, so like I said, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you my contact details. So you can always contact me as well. Um, you can contact the ICV, the admin as well, and you can contact the commission as well. So we're all we're all here. Um, uh, th there's also the faith, um, uh, uh, the child safe standards um, organized as well. So th there's a, there'll be a lot of people around you to try to support you as you go through the thing. So, but the first at the first instance, have a look, have a look at, through that toolkit. See if um, if there's something that will address what you're talking about in terms of events. I think there, I'm pretty sure there is. If there isn't, then let, let's talk and let's talk about how do we adapt something for you. Okay. All right. How are we going? I'm really running out of time. I think um, it's almost Asa, is it? Yeah, yeah. Asa is a five twenty one. All right. Um, report. Well, we'll talk about report, reportable conduct, I suppose. Um, uh, so <laughs> the Victorian reportable conduct scheme. This is the other part of the Child Safety Act. So the Child Safety Standards is one part. The other part is the Victorian Reportable Conduct Scheme. And this one recently, um, yeah, uh, this one recently came into effect in 2018. 2018, perfect. Okay. So what is it? Basically, it seeks to improve organisations' responses to allegations of child abuse and neglect by their workers and volunteers. Again, there's the Act which supports the scheme, and it's designed to ensure that the Commission, the Commission of Children and Young People, I just showed you their website, is aware of every allegation of serious misconduct involving children in certain organisations that have care, supervision, and authority over children. So remember we talked about reporting bodies. So if an incident occurs, who do you report to? Well, depending on the severity of the incident, triple O, police, of course. Um, someone mentioned... Um, uh, child protection, of course, perfect, good example. The third statutory body which has sort of come into being is the Commission for Children and Young People. So another obligation, um, and we'll go through um, the criteria of what uh, what is uh, reportable, is that you also need to notify the Commission now as well. So that's another obligation which has been put on organisations as well. Okay, So it's no longer just the, the police, the... Um, uh, child protection it's also the commission for children and young people okay so um there there uh sorry if you just go back quickly um and as i mentioned the commission is there to support and guide organizations that receive allegations um and they help you with um uh, develop effective and appropriate responses the other the second function is they independently oversee and monitor where appropriate and make recommendations to improve the response of those organizations okay uh, okay, so here we go um, in terms of which organisations are covered by that scheme, religious bodies, organisations that are religious bodies, um, organisations that offer overnight camps, um, public health services, um, and then approved uh, education, children's services, certain prescribed arts. That's just a little, um, little summary. Yeah, jump through. Okay, so requirements of the head of the organisation. So now um, we're talking about the, the particular head of the organisation because it is the responsibility of the head of the organisation to actually report the allegation, yeah? If the head of the allegation does not report, well, if you don't want the head of the allegation to report, um, uh, sorry, the head of the organisation to report the allegation, you need to nominate someone else to do it, but you need to fill out a form on the Commission's website to do that. 
Otherwise, it's autom otherwise it is assumed that the head of the organization is responsible for carrying out the, um, the reportable conduct scheme. So in most cases, I think that would be you, uh, brother, I think in terms of IMCV. <laughs> so it's probably most pertinent to you. But like I said, um, some organizations have committees, some people they, they nominate, for instance, uh, ICV. Um, uh, our, our president is uh, Muhammad Mohidin, but he's entrusted me to be the person that reports on um, the reportable conduct schemes. So again, you need to identify for religious organizations, identify or nominate the head of the organization. Person who is primarily responsible for the organization's management of any allegations of abuse of children. And then you have to establish with the head of organization systems to, 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 to deter and prevent abuse and procedures for responding to any allegations that may occur. That's really that policy and procedure that we talked about in that um, uh, fifth standard there. Okay, now the other responsibility the, the head has is they need to ensure the commission is notified and given updates on the organization's response to an allegation. Okay? And the reportable conduct scheme, as I mentioned, does not replace the need to report allegations of child abuse, including criminal conduct and family violence to Victoria Police. So it's not you report to the commission and that's it. If it is a criminal offense, you need to report it to the police as well. So you need to report to both, both bodies. Okay. Yep. All right. So here's a snapshot of the head of the organization's obligations under the reportable conduct scheme. Um, you must notify the commission within three business days of becoming aware of a reportable allegation. So the minute it becomes raised uh, formally to you, you need, you've got three business days to contact the commission, call them or fill out the, the form on their website, I think. Form on the website? Yeah, form on the website um, to submit the, the, the allegation. Then you must investigate an allegation. And this is a little bit of a, uh, an interesting process. So I might, um, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Subject to police clearance or criminal matters or the matters in, involving family violence. So if, it's, if it fits in those domains, um, you, you, need to be, you need to be considerate of the police clearance, yeah? Um, obviously, you have to advise the commission who is undertaking the investigation, and you must manage the risk to children at that stage as well. Update. Within 30 calendar days, you must provide the commission detailed information about the reportable allegation and any action you may have taken. So they're, they're going to come back after 30 days and say, um, give us an update on your investigation, what's happened. You must notify the commission of investigation findings and any disciplinary action the head of entity has taken or the reasons no action was taken. Now, investigations, so just like um, HR, most of us are not actually equipped to run investigations. It's not like what we see on TV and it's not you, you corral the person, you, you demand answers or anything like that. Um, there is a proper process and proper procedure to run an investigation. Um, and the commission is also aware organizations do not have that capacity nor the skills or the training to actually necessarily run investigations themselves or have people within the organization that that might be able to run an investigation so they are working on strategies to work work with investigate well you know what i'm going to call noreen to talk about investigations actually she'll, she'll give you a bit of a better picture around it Um, just to clarify, uh, you might be thinking that why is there so much duplication of reporting? So I just wanted to clarify, I don't know if you have a slide on this. So the commission wants to capture misconduct only by specific people in the organization. So your workers and volunteers only, so not your general membership. So uh, the kinds of uh, uh, investigation findings uh, will investigate whether the um, misconduct actually occurred by uh, a volunteer or uh, a member uh, uh, worker at the organization. So if you are not a worker or a volunteer, your conduct is not reportable. That's one thing. The second thing is we have a 50 page guideline on how to conduct investigations and we have an, a, a whole a whole team dedicated at the commission which guides organizations on 
step by step on what to do if uh, a, a reportable conduct has occurred. Now, the aim is to really uh, build capacity of organizations to be able to conduct investigations. So the first investigation, the commission will hold your hand, take you through the whole process. Wherever you feel you need more information or guidance, you can always call your caseworker. But uh, subsequently, um, second, third, fourth investigation, we don't even want to want those uh, conducts to happen. But if they occur, then um, your capacity uh, will have increased, um, hopefully. Uh, but the conduct could be of a totally different kind. So if it's a more serious allegation, um, you know, you may want more guidance. Um, in our annual report last year, the most common form of misconduct was uh, physical violence against children. Um, the other thing that I don't know if you cover. Do you want to talk about the allegations? The that, five that types? Five, yeah, okay. five types. So there are five categories of reportable conduct. The first one is sexual um, sexual abuse. Sexual, sexual, abuse. sexual abuse. Yeah. No, the, yeah, second the, the second one is second one, misconduct. misconduct. Yeah. So sexual abuse is pretty obvious. It's going to be almost always criminal, uh, a criminal offense. So the first point of call is who are you going to report to? First person that comes to mind, who are you going to report to if it's a criminal offense the police, police. exactly once the police in, is involved then the commission takes a step backwards back i mean and uh, the police police conducts an investigation so with the royal commission what uh, one of the one of the things that came out of the royal commission was that some criminal offenses are not meeting the threshold where the police will conduct the investigation so they were falling through the craps cracks and not being um, captured anywhere so that's where the commission comes into uh, that space, you know, okay, this doesn't meet the criminal threshold, but we still want to investigate to keep children safe. So uh, the commission purposefully has kept a very low threshold of reportability. So you can, con uh, you can always, you know, um, report um, uh, allegations of uh, sexual abuse to the commission, which don't meet the requirements of, or the threshold of the police. The other thing is that, I don't know if you know this, Eamon, but uh, the commission has an embedded police officer in the commission. So mm -hmm. if anything, you know, because this um, scheme is so new, if you forget to tell the commission, the police and the commission are always talking to each other. So if you've called one, it is advisable that you call the other but if you don't we will there is a, um, a sort of a, what do you call it? a net and, uh, you yeah, know good. the the second category of uh, reportable conduct is sexual offenses so what that means is um, for example if a teacher is giving a ride to a child from the school to the child's home that's not reportable conduct that could be against the code of conduct the teach teacher may not be allowed to drive children home but if um, the teacher is talking to the child about uh, content which is sexual in nature that could be a sexual offense so it's it's a bit of the I don't want to call it a gray area, but there are examples of what doesn't really uh, fall into the category of sexual offense sexual misconduct is really going against your code of ethics or code of conduct which is sexual in nature the third category is physical violence which is pretty self-explanatory so any hitting kicking pushing grabbing shoving um, and also threats of violence so if you've raised a hand to intentionally intentionally uh, intimidate a child um, that, you know, physical violence will occur against you. That is also reportable because that has an impact on the child emotionally. And all of these three categories, sexual uh, abuse, sexual misconduct, and physical contact, con uh, physical <laughs> violence, uh, need to occur in the presence of a child, with the child, or against a child. So these three categories, they're a little bit complex. If you have a look at information sheet number one on the web on the commission's website, it goes into detail. And then we have a specific information sheet dedicated to each of the categories. Mm -hmm. Category number four is behaviors that cause um, significant emotional and psychological, psychological harm. So what that would mean is maybe uh, something like bullying or intimidation or anything which can cause a child to suffer emotionally or psychologically. 
and the last one is significant neglect um that means if you're not, if if a person fails to provide adequate shelter medication food the basic needs of a child are not being meant, met this uh falls under the category of significant neglect now with medication uh, one thing to keep in mind is um and this i should have sort of covered under physical uh violence uh is there anyone here who is allergic to food or any other items and carries an epi pen for example i'm just kind of throwing that out there so let's say if if somebody is um uh allergic and needs to be um the epi pen needs to be administered now that's a pretty invasive process to deliver the epi pen it 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 it's painful so if you're causing pain to save a child from death then obviously that's not reportable conduct so you have to uh keep in mind that there are certain types of physical harm that that are necessary for example if a child is about to cross the road and there's a car coming and you're grabbing that child to save him or her that's not reportable conduct but if it's intentionally done to harm a child that's reportable conduct can i also elaborate quickly on the reasonable belief yeah please so the reportable conduct scheme is an allegation based scheme we don't want you to have 100% proof before you pick up the phone and call the um commission uh, if you have reasonable doubt a uh, reasonable belief sorry uh, that uh, an allegation has occurred so for example uh, the allegation is against me and i was rostered to perform that duty at mosque on that certain day i'm not out of the country i am not uh, physically absent from that space if you if you've got um uh, cctv footage that you know i was physically present here then that all forms part of the reasonable belief but for example if i wasn't even physically able to be present here and somebody is making a malicious uh, allegation against a worker or volunteer at your organization that's obviously not reportable like you don't even have to call the commission so your your committee needs to basically decide whether something is reportable or not um investigations i think i've covered i think you covered most of it i think i think we've covered all of it okay uh, yeah is there anything uh, else you want to add before we wrap reportable conduct i wanted to just quickly touch base about, uh, on how reportable conduct is related to the child safe okay. standards you might think that they're two very distinct um policies they they are yes uh, so child safe standards actually applies to about 60000 organizations in victoria it's a more flexible scheme which is open to interpretation according to the your organization and that's basically keeping in mind the width and breadth of the organizations that are covered so 60000 is a lot of organizations um the reportable and and the child safe standards are a preventative scheme so they're trying to prevent any abuse from occurring reportable conduct applies to about 15000 organizations um they must already have child safe safe standards in uh being implemented and they are very prescriptive as you have seen so the 3 day reporting uh obligation and then 30 day the other thing is that the investigation doesn't need to be completed by 30 days so uh it's just a touch point where the commission just wants to know uh what's happening if the police in is investigating your 30 day update will say that the police in is investigating we haven't touched it uh and another really tricky part of reportable conduct scheme is that it captures conduct outside the workplace as well mm -hmm. so your in in your case uh it captures the conduct outside of the masjid so it's it's a pretty um wholesome uh, approach and also uh, the other thing the commission is really uh, emphasizing on is to investigate uh, not sorry to interview children during an investigation so if the child is not going to experience uh, trauma uh, if uh, you know uh, during an invest uh, an interview then um, we are encouraged i mean the commission's um stan is to interview the child as well uh because that part forms part of the child safe standard number 7 mm -hmm. the empowerment and participation of children so every reportable uh allegation becomes an opportunity to revisit your child safe standards 
and try to figure out what has happened, what what uh, preventative measures I can put in place for this to not ever happen again. So it's it's really an opportunity, and that's how these uh, schemes are connected to each other. So um, we want child safe standards to prevent reportable conduct from occur, but if a reportable conduct occurs, the investigation will um, bring to light uh, information which you can use to further make your child safe standards more Enhance robust. Yeah. 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 Great. That's, that's it. That's all we need. All right. Uh, I think that, and you've pretty much covered off reportable conduct. So um, we might keep you up here if there's any questions, because I think that's that's the end. We'll, we'll finish there. Anyone have any questions? Questions? Um, sorry. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Just wanted to know one type of a physical abuse. Just in case, let's say, a child over seven years old, and he doesn't want to pray, he doesn't want to solat. And then my understanding is based on the suggestion of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam that we can hit the him. So if we doing that as for a religious reason, is that can be considered physical abuse as well or no? So physically hitting a child is yes. not illegal in Victoria. But the, if, if, you're, if you're hitting the child to the extent that it's causing any bruises or any physical harm, that, okay. is, that becomes reportable. Um, okay. The other thing is that um, we're encouraging people to think beyond culture. So this is something which is a legal requirement in Australia. So when we adopt Australia as our homeland, we are... We, you know, we are citizens of Australia. There are certain cultural practices which are not um, practicable here. So we want to keep that in mind as well. I, I'm not saying what you're saying is incorrect. I'm saying that um, that's something we need to keep in mind, something to consider. OK, just a color. Thank you very much. And again, you have to remember, if you're not a volunteer or worker, your conduct is not reportable. <laughs> uh, do you want to know what the definition of a volunteer is? Okay, so a volunteer has to come in contract with the head of organization in a verbal or a written agreement. So for example, if you're having uh, a gathering here where somebody decides that you know we've, we're going to expect some elderly people, I'm going to put some chairs out, but that person is doing it out of the goodness of their heart, He's volunteering his time or her time to put the chairs out. That is not considered a volunteer under the scheme. A volunteer has to be requested um, to put the chairs out or to teach every Sunday school. Or um, it's, it's really coming into contract with the workplace or the organization. And that defines what a volunteer is. So, so have a think about that. And I was also going to say, uh, suggest, Eamon, having a code of conduct for different roles is also a suggestion that the commission puts forward. So if you, want, if you may want to have a code of conduct for volunteers. So if you sign someone up, just tell them to have a read, quickly sign it. It means you're covered. It means that person understands what is expected to them. There is no gray area. Everything is black and white. So then when an allegation, God forbid, arises, then you can say, look, you already knew this was not expected of you. Now it's going to be reportable. Um, Do we have a template for that one? Yeah, there's templates for that as well. Yeah, great. And, and yeah, um, the Child Safe Organization, the guide, yes. um, has a lot of uh, templates. We've also just released the guide for faith communities for the reportable conduct scheme it's a four page uh, document five page document um, which makes reportable conduct really easily digestible for volunteer organizations it was um uh, and we'll, i'll be sending a link uh with the pdf of this and, and I'll, along with the other resources as well do you want to Also, by the way, if you want to know a little bit more about um, child safe standards, the commission runs regular information sessions in the city, in the city, which are free of charge. So, um, again, in the resources, there'll be a link 
to the um, the commission's website, which will show you what what time those um informations and what dates are on. They are updated regularly. And I think we are in time for. Yep. Uh, just for everyone's benefits, I've got uh, Sister Nurin uh, context as well, so which I will spread across uh, to everyone. Uh, so just in case anyone needs any more info, inshallah, we'll distribute this across, inshallah. Great. Um, we've got like eight minutes left before the azan. Anyone would like to pose any question before we close off? Going once. Okay. Um, Jazakumullah khair, uh, Brother Ayman and Sister Nurin. I mean, uh, we really appreciate your time to come here. And uh, it's been like a great pleasure for us to have you here. And definitely, uh, it's a bit enlightenment. But these things, and hopefully we can implement the policy within our organization, which is what we are aiming for. And uh, hopefully we will engage you more in more details discussion. And uh, we look forward to working closely with you guys. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair, brother. And th thank you so much for uh, having us here today as well. We appreciate being invited along. Again, um, uh, this is just the start of the journey. You're not alone as well. You, you have resources and support around you, so don't, don't feel daunted. Um, if you have any questions, contact us, contact the commission. We'll try to uh, walk through it. But more importantly, if you can, spread the message across to the people that aren't here brothers and sisters that might be working with children because it's really important that they know that the law has changed. We don't want anyone to be caught out at all. You know, it's uh, it's just uh, important for all of us. So, Jazakallah here again. And Jazakallah. Um, just before we close off, oh, we've got um, food after this one. So, we've got um, two biryani rice, uh, lamb and chicken, and with... Uh, Food for kids as well, uh, 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 KFC. So inshallah, after Asa prayer, we're gonna have like a, a bit of, of food, and then we can mingle around and uh, have some conversation. Uh, all right. Uh, I would like to thank everyone to be able to come here, and inshallah, this will benefit us. Inshallah. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let's close off with the Dua Kafartul Majlis. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu alayhi wa 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 alayh